Okay, really excited to finally do this, Ari. Yes, We've been talking about this for a long I'm time. Hydrating for my donation later, it's important. People always ask me, so uh, how do you keep your sperm count so high? And I think a key is probably just a lot of water. I don't know if you're kidding. I don't know. Maybe I made it up, maybe I didn't. Okay, well, let's let's build up your story as to how you got into this position for yourself. Like, where are you from? How were you raised? Mm-hmm. Well, I was born and raised in Muncie, New York. It's a, possibly the largest Orthodox Jewish community outside of Israel. I guess it's Brooklyn, Muncie. Uh, those are the uh, top three. And it was a very traditional Orthodox Jewish lifestyle. So I went to yeshiva for elementary school, high school, all boys yeshiva. In fact, all of my classmates looked like me and sounded like me. They all were Ashkenazi, white Jews. Yeah, I met with one of your classmates recently. I think I texted you that he knew you from elementary school, and he was pretty shocked at like how you became the sperminator, someone with a hundred plus kids. Who? Who did you meet? Which? Braun. David Braun. I think so. Uh, might be a two Brauns. Anyhow, so you <laughs> okay. so you were raised Orthodox, very conservative, and you went to yeshiva. Yes. Were you, were you the wild kid in the class? I got suspended here and there. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't for like anything like drug use or anything heinous that maybe a kid would typically get suspended for. You know, I didn't know the next word. You know, sometimes the Gemara, you know, they were like, Ari Nagel, what's the next word? And I'd be like, Vyimer. And they're like, no, <laughs> get out of my class. Right. Um, but I was getting kicked out here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, one time I got kicked out. And then my dad was like, what am I paying? Like, tuition for if you want to kick him out you know get, you, you want to kick him out give me my money back or leave him in there to kick him out of school is only rewarding him because then he gets to hang out at home and watch tv you know like we should keep him in school that's the punishment so they said all right let's go to a dintora dintora is obviously like a tribunal of where instead of going to court you'd go to a rabbi and ask rabbi's a rabbi arbitrary. and then the exactly the rabbi's the arbitrator so uh, the principal said okay which rabbi should we use and then my dad said no 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 you could pick pick any rabbi and sure enough he picked a um, I think it was the Rosh Hashiva of Beishraga. Maybe it was Schwab or I don't know, some big Rosh Hashiva. And uh, my father ended up winning the Din Torah. He was like, the guy was like, no, take the kid, put him into school. So you were forced by judicial mandate to be back in Yeshiva. <laughs> yeah. okay. Even though you were kind of the... So how did this start? Like that's How did you start? Because this is obviously a very different lifestyle than an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle. So how did you start getting into donating sperm or sort of veering off of the path that would be uh, your upbringing? I think probably until I was 17, I was keeping all 613 uh, commandments, mm -hmm. you know, and I was Shomer Shabbos, I was kosher. And then uh, I bought a motorcycle because I couldn't really afford a car. So I bought a motorcycle to get around and is it like a day or two before my brother's wedding and I, I was driving um, uh, in Muncie and uh, a guy happened to be a guy learning in coal ran a stop sign and um, I got into a motorcycle accident and I didn't even hire a lawyer. Um, you may be upset, but uh, the insurance company gave me 70 grand tax-free uh, to spend how I wish. And uh, my father's advice was not to invest it because it's blood money. He said, enjoy it. And that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. But I was, even with 70 grand, I was still like a bit of a that's cheap crazy. Jew. And uh, I stretched it out and I traveled to over 40 countries with that $70,000. All when I was quite young and impressionable. And um I was actually went to India 25 years ago, and I was just back in India uh, last week. But 25 years ago, I went to India, and I went for three months. But I went to around 40 countries uh, with that money. But on that trip to India, I think I was like a vegetarian for three months. Uh, but then from India, I ended up flying to Jordan. And after not eating meat for three months, the uh, I asked a guy for a recommendation on a restaurant, and he was like, you want the best shawarma? Well, it's right up the block. And uh, that was the first time I ate non-kosher food, and I think there was just no turning back. Did it you was have like, like, any guilt, though, in that moment? Uh, you know, it was just so cheap and affordable and delicious. And, yeah, You're I, like, Dad, this one's for you. I'm enjoying the money. I think it's hard, but, you know, the more I traveled, and, of course, I was in India, and you see people worship 
worshiping the cows and worshiping the monkeys and you know and then you meet other people who are struggling with very similar i remember like you know meeting a jehovah's witness who was just super scared of the armageddon but she knew it was fake but she had to force herself and i think just traveling i, I mean i grew up in a ghetto i never really left muncie all other other people that i knew looked and sounded like me you didn't really have any opposing viewpoints so i think when you have that experience and you have it at such a young age and you're quite impressionable you know it's so common after high school for uh, you know, yeshiva kids like me to go to Israel for the year. Uh, and th th it's so impressionable that sometimes they just become so devout and so religious and then they become rabbis. And um, that happened to my oldest brother and he's still a rabbi. And I think it was just because he was at that young impressionable age. And then when he became a rabbi and he didn't want to go back to college, get a college education, my father was disappointed and said, you know what, I don't think we're going to send our of my other kids to Israel. And uh, so I never went to Israel for a year after high school and had that year of yeshiva to, uh, that, that's quite influential because you're at such an impressionable young age. And instead, I ended up going to India, and then that was all downhill after that. Downhill is uh, kind of, you're joking <laughs> about that, but like, I mean, are, are you joking about that? What do you mean downhill? After Religiously. That? Religiously. No, I still would consider myself a very good Jew. You know, but obviously I'm practicing the faith not in the same way. Yeah, as you're on my your own ancestors. island in a way. <laughs> yeah. Had it so even so, that's still a very big leap. So even though you became much more open minded because you traveled a lot, that's still a big leap to be the number one sperm donator in the world. Uh, yes. Like had, well, uh, you know, I think probably if you would have asked me at 17 what my life is going to look like, it probably would have looked like all of my four brothers and two sisters. Mm -hmm. They're all married in very traditional relationships, having very, very traditional families. And, you know, speaking of, you know, my classmates and how they all looked like me and sounded like me and were the same faith. Now I have children of so many different colors and so many different faiths. Uh, of course, uh, I even have my son with me now who, uh, you know, yes. is probably a different faith uh, maybe or certainly a different race and um you know we're talking the same language but that's not always the case uh -huh. uh, yeah we're gonna yesterday i was in memphis with uh my son uh who was born august 8th but august 10th uh, uh, his brother was born in abuja nigeria you know and uh, these two boy brothers are gonna meet someday and uh, even though they're growing up very very different lifestyles mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll bring on Tyler. He hasn't he hasn't looked quite bored yet, so this is this is a win. But what did you what um what did you do after that? So you you stretch out the seventy grand, which by the way, it's not tax free. If you get a settlement, you get taxed on it. So I don't know how you got around that. But it was Reagan, I think he he had some sort of act at the time. I don't know. So you get the money, you spend it, you go traveling forty countries, and then what? Now you're eighteen. Yeah, no, it took me a couple of years to plow through the years. 70 grand. Yes, of course, because I was going to school at the time. So I basically take off every third semester. And then um, I would, um, you know, even just in the college schedule you have off in the summer, you have a winter break, you have a summer break, you have a spring break. So I was taking uh, time off. I, I did three months in India, but I did a month in Thailand, and then I did a European trip, and then I did some Israel trips, mm. and I was bouncing around. But I think that's really where I gave up perhaps uh, the Orthodox Jewish faith. It wasn't really where I started having children. I think th the reason I ha have so many children is right here in this room. And it's him. I had him when I was, well, I was clubbing. Uh, I was in my 20s. And, uh, of course, um, uh, making up for lost time. Because I think when you go to an old boys elementary school and an old boys high school, you tend to be very uh, socially awkward when it comes to college. And then all of a sudden, I'm in co-ed classes for the first time. And most of the girls that I spoke to were my like my sister and my mom. You know, So uh, it took me a little time. Uh, but it, eventually, I think in my 20s, I was making up for lost time and maybe partying a little too much, as a lot of 20-year-olds uh, may do. And I went to a club called Webster Hall. And that's uh, where I met his mom, and uh, we um, had a, you know, I don't know if we would call it dating, but it was like a casual romance, and uh, we had a, a little accident. He didn't want to call him an accident. He was very much wanted and loved and <laughs> cared for. Oh, I'm very proud of him, and uh, but he wasn't planned. It was an unplanned uh, mm -hmm. pregnancy, and at that point, I think. Uh, the idea of perhaps embracing my Orthodox Jewish faith was uh, sealed shut. I don't think that really was an option for me. And while still being able to be a good father to my eldest, but I certainly enjoyed being a father. Uh, and um, it gave me the desire to obviously create a big family uh, just because I'm from a big family. And then I grew up in a neighborhood of big families. So I always wanted a big family, but it wasn't really happening in the 
Orthodox Jewish way of a traditional type of family. Uh, so I explored uh, untraditional means. Mm -hmm. And I have two 13-year-olds, and I don't think they could be more different. But um, in the end, I was using Craigslist to like find my housekeeper or sell my old motorcycle. Craigslist is just the free classified ad section. Nobody really uses it as much anymore, but it was quite popular uh, back then, uh, 25 years ago. Mm. Well, hang on. So you... Yeah, but he's 18 years ago. So uh, this was 13, 14 years ago. I was on Craigslist and I saw an ad for a, um, a, a, it was actually two women. One was a single religious Jewish woman who wanted a uh, child and she was a single mother by choice. Well, not by choice. She wasn't meeting anyone. She was living on the Upper West Side and she wasn't meeting her Bashert or her significant other. And she was uh, realized that she's either going to have a child now or never. And uh, we ended up, it was interesting because uh, she was in her 40s. So doing it the old fashioned way was not really an option. Uh, so we ended up using a clinic. Why wasn't it an option? She was too old. Um, and she, she needed some boosting from, a she needed a, a lot of help. Correct. So we had to use a fertility clinic, uh, to conceive that child, but she wanted Wait, the child. How did she connect with you? She posted an ad. She on posted an ad. Yeah. 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 And, um, we, she wanted to get married because she wanted the child to be accepted in the Jewish faith. And, uh, that's what we ended up doing. Um, it was just a religious marriage with a rabbi and he married us. And then whatever, after a certain period of time, we ended up getting divorced. But I remember very vividly, uh, the rabbi leaning over to me and said, you're doing a very, very big mitzvah. You're doing a very, very good deed. Well, Orthodox rabbi. An Orthodox rabbi. Yeah. And he seemed to think so. Um, of course, I don't know if he would have that same opinion for all 116 other kids, but for this particular one, he felt like helping out this single woman, have a Jewish, uh, uh child and be able to. Uh, have the child know who the father is and uh, he seemed to think so but at the same time I have another 13 year old who was a lesbian couple and it was an African American woman and she had three children three boys she wanted a girl but uh, the, the father of the other children died and she was in a committed relationship for 16 years and she was young enough where we were able to try on our own I didn't really know of another way to conceive so we ended up conceiving the baby the old fashioned way mm-hmm so I ended up conceiving the uh, baby the old-fashioned way with the lesbian, but then with the heterosexual single woman, I ended up using a clinic, mm -hmm. which is I'm ironic. Sure at this point, it's not, you know, it's, you all kinds of different ways. But before we get more into that, like, how did you become a professor? I know that you're a tenured professor now. You teach math. How did that happen? My dad is a professor, and uh, I think just always seeing him home and not working too hard, you know, uh, I knew that's what I always wanted to be. So... From day one, I said, but I want to be like him. <laughs> I don't think my son feels the same way. We'll have him on the show in a little bit, and we'll, <laughs> we'll see. But I think if there's anything he wants to emulate, it's uh -huh. probably not my prolific lifestyle. It's probably my job, because uh -huh. he does see how little I work. I, today was my first day back after over two and a half years of teaching online. So... Yeah, but you love it. Is your dad... Do you think your dad's proud of you at all, or...? Like, what's your relationship uh, I think a, a, maybe ashamed would be a better word than ashamed. proud. Yes, I don't oh. think he's proud. <laughs> when did the shame kick in? Did you tell them about, let's say, Tyler or um, the other kids? Let's say, like, the Orthodox woman. Did you tell them about that? Like, what prompted you to respond to that ad? So you have one unplanned pregnancy, and yes. then you're like... I enjoyed being a father. Perhaps maybe I could have done less with the drama, or the baby mama drama, you know, which there was some. So I felt like this was a better avenue to be With your to first kid's mom, there was some drama. Correct. But why... So then why compound that? I mean, involving more people. Well, that's the thing. I think the drama wasn't, uh, the, you know, the relationship that I was going to have with the child. The drama was relationship drama, you know, and had nothing really to do. We weren't fighting over... I mean, I love Tyler. She loved Tyler. We had no reason to argue about that. Uh, in the end, we were arguing because it was a relationship. I said, wouldn't it be better and cleaner to have a child not in the context of a relationship where, you know, we could just both uh, love and care and uh, about the child and be less concerned. And uh, You didn't I, want to make it work with her? You, you guys had a casual thing going on at some point. I tried to explain to her that... Uh, you know, in the end, ultimately, my parents are not going to be happy and uh, make it work. 
but they must have not been happy with you anyways because you're not keeping kosher and you're already straying from the path and you probably weren't wearing a kippah around them and Shabbat and all the all those things. I still wear a kippah when I see my parents. So I put on a hat and we still love each other very much and we still remain very, very close. Mm-hmm. Happy birthday to my mom. She turned 74 uh, this week. So, Aww, happy uh, birthday. Yeah, and uh, of course it's funny because uh, I'd still go visit them the most uh, because they go to Florida for the winters and all my brothers and sisters can't get that kind of time off because they need permissions from their wives to <laughs> escape to Florida. But I spend much of the winters in Florida. So uh, we have a good relationship, even if they're maybe mm-hmm. unhappy with my lifestyle. And, you know, I think as they get older, maybe they're mellowing out mellowing out a little bit, but uh, probably not. Mm-hmm. I, I still don't understand, though, why the next the next kid you respond to the craigslist ad and then an ad and then another ad yeah i think the reasons i started is probably very different than the reasons i continue so perhaps so early on me on both well early on i think i enjoyed being a father and i wanted to grow my family and just like i had a big family but then you have you know a boy you have a girl and then you know 10 or 12 you know you don't really i don't really need the desire or have a desire to grow my family anymore um i have 117 children already and um you said 116 before. You're 117? Um, he has 116 siblings. Maybe that's what oh, I, I said, see, I but see, there's 117 it. total. Mm-hmm. But I could be off by one or two. That's fine. <laughs> you know, I had a uh, free mental media was reaching out to me like uh, two weeks ago. It's some kind of, I don't know, production company. They wanted to do a show on if uh, you have any DNA answers, the questions that you want answered. And then it's a show that'll do that research and find your DNA. And they wanted to do an episode on me. And I'm pretty sure, and they asked if I had any DNA questions answered. I'm pretty sure that this children out there that I don't know about, you know? Uh, and then sometimes I have moms tell me that we had a child together and I'm suspect of that too. So they could go be off one or two either way. Uh, but I have 11 women pregnant. And uh, so currently, currently, yes. And I'd love to talk with you about like the legal implications and the different cultures that you've had kids in and stuff like that, but still trying to get to the origins. So yeah. So yeah. the reasons I started, maybe it was to grow my family, but that's not the reasons I continue. I think uh, you look at the moms and you see how happy they are. You see the kids and see how happy they are. And then you have families that are reaching out to you for help and looking to grow their family. And I could say, well, I have 117 kids. I don't really want any more children, but they'd be like, well, I don't have any children. You know, I just want my one. And mm-hmm. uh, yesterday I was in Memphis helping a woman have uh, children. She has a, a daughter and a son and uh, she wanted to uh, have another child and she's a kindergarten teacher and she was fostering kids uh, her whole life and she just wants to uh, have another child and she's 41 she's running out of time and she's a single mother by choice and you know I'm very invested in her journey and mm-hmm. very much would like to help her grow her family because she's a phenomenal mother and she has a beautiful family Mm -hmm. and um, we have a seven month old so I know it's still young but uh, we've never fought not even had one disagreement about anything Uh, of course she does make all the decisions concerning the child uh, and that's okay Uh, but even when I agree or disagree Mm -hmm. you know what we have a lot of love for each other even if it's not of the romantic nature and I think that's true of a lot of the families I helped. And I feel bad because uh, my son here, he probably saw me fight with his mother many, many times, you know, and mm-hmm. I don't think that's something any child should ever have to see. Uh, but the vast majority of my children, I could safely say that I never fought with any of their mothers once. Nice. But this is still very quizzical. Even in the beginning, so you want to have a large family at a certain point, 10, 12, 15, 20 kids, 30 kids. It's like, yeah. Well, a transition to just helping these, you know, once you do it and you uh-huh. see how happy the kids are and how happy the moms are, but then, yeah, oh, you're right. I had no desire to Maybe the moms are happy, anymore. but what about uh, considering the kids? Like, it's not possible for you to be there in, like, a real capacity. Uh, 100%. I can't. I, I already know I'll never be able to be a father to my children like my father was to me, where he was providing for me. He was tucking me in at night. He was telling me bedtime stories. He's providing for me financially in the more than I'm doing from any of my children. So uh, that obviously makes me sad, but... A lot of these women aren't, you know, choosing me as their first choice. I think I, I think it's safe to say I'm, I was nobody's first choice. Okay. Well, you were the Orthodox woman's first choice. No, so you're my Orthodox Jewish person. woman's first choice would be that she would meet her significant other and fall in love and meet her right, prince charming, mm-hmm. and that didn't happen. So then I was her backup plan, mm-hmm. you know, and she had two options. One option was go purchase frozen anonymous sperm 
and she could have done that. Finances was not. She probably spent over fifty grand to have that baby. Uh, the the extra thousand dollars that she would have had to pay for the frozen sperm was not the uh, deal breaker. Uh, I think for her it was she wanted the child to know. She wanted the child to be accepted in the community. There were a lot of other reasons other than financial. Uh, that well, I mean, if you, she wanted the child to be accepted in the community, you kind of decimated that opportunity for the kid. No, because we have a, a a marriage contract, you know, and the kids very much is accepted. Yeah, but accepted. this kid's what in yeshiva, and he's like, they're like, "Who's your dad?" And he's like, "Oh, it's this guy. He's got over a hundred kids." Oh, he like, has a sh- he has a shaved head with longer bias. I mean, he has long side curls, uh-huh. and uh, he's um, he, he was bar mitzvah this year. He's living in Israel. He's living in the most religious community in Israel. So, uh, <laughs> you know, but if he listen. You're just banking on them not having access to the internet to figure out who you are. (laughs) You know, uh, I I was in Israel, uh, I got back Thursday. So uh, I have three children in Israel, and I went to visit uh, two out of the three. I did not see this 13-year-old, and that's because the mother doesn't want me to uh, see. And sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. Like I was in Israel in February of 2020. And she wanted me to spend time, and we did spend a lot of quality time between me and the kid. And then this time she felt differently. I was in Israel in November. I was in Israel the, this week. Um, so it varies, and it's always up to her. I message her when I'm in Israel, and I think she's torn. It's interesting because she said if she dies, she doesn't want the child to go to me. She wants the child to go to my brother. My brother has five daughters, and he felt like he's in a very traditional relationship, did and your he would be better. On to that? My brother signed on. Of course, we're all hoping she doesn't die. You know? right, <laughs> but right. if she does, my brother definitely agreed, and uh, he would. Probably probably do a better job than me. So, of course, I'd be okay with that. Okay, so this kid, and then you have another one with the lesbian couple. And then, then I had an ex-girlfriend who reached out to me, uh, we, um, who we have a 12-year-old together. And she was heard what I did for the lesbian couple, and she said, hey, can you do the same thing for me? And, um, yeah, and then it just grew. It just grew. I was having around two or three kids a year for maybe the first... Um, for most people, having a kid is like, is like very, it's very scary. It's very daunting, very well thought out, very planned. They're not, you know, there's all these jokes in pop culture. Like, oh, I don't want to have a kid, you know, out of wedlock or without, you know, you got to wear protection and all that. Like, how is that not, how is that not a concern for you? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, walking into these situations, you're just sort of like bucking completely what's normal for human beings. I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of moms that stress too much, and then I, I don't think I stress enough. So I feel like maybe the kids will be normal and stress just the right amount. But I do think that, uh, yeah, I should probably have a lot of situations that would stress a lot of people out. And I think I maybe just have a high tolerance uh, for stress. Do you ever stress. get paid for this? Like, are you doing it for the money? Like, what's what's motivating you now yeah. at this point? So you said you wanted to have a large family. Like, what's motivating you past kid number 20? Uh, I, 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 it was well before 20. You know, once you have a boy and a girl, I don't think there's really a, a major desire. Yeah. Uh, you know, being able to spread so much love and joy to mm-hmm. so many different beautiful families. Uh, you know, and going back, you asked me, well, you know, what kind of father am I going to be? But, you know, these women were going to use frozen anonymous sperm, you know? And what kind of father would that uh, guy have been? He would have been anonymous, you know? And maybe at 18, there's a small chance that the father would have gotten to know the child. And I think what we're doing is much more natural. People always say, well, then why don't you do it the normal way? Why don't you just go donate in a clinic? But there's nothing normal about that. Uh, that's completely unnatural. I think what we're but doing is much more natural. there's something protected and sacred about that process because because it's like very much confined and contained. Like it's with not this, protected. It's like, it really isn't. Like, it's completely wouldn't, unprotected. Wouldn't you need to consider? Wouldn't you need to consider Tyler, for example? Like in having kid number twenty or thirty, you know, you got to you have to consider the, the other children. Like it's at a certain point, you're bringing a lot of chaos into a lot of people's lives. Yes, you know, especially when you speak to donor conceived children, I think there's a few things that are overwhelmingly clear, and one of them is. We don't want our father to have, you know, more than a dozen kids because then we feel it's impossible to have a relationship with that said person, you know, because some of them get to find out who their dad is at 18 and then they never really get to have a relationship because they got to share him with so many other uh, siblings. So that speaks to me, you know, that concerns me. Uh, But I'm not lying to the mothers about how many children I have, you know, Uh, they reach out to me and ask me for help to grow their family and, um, a lot of these children, you know, 
listen, there a lot of them are young, but none of them are lacking love. I mean, the mothers are loving them. And of course, uh, not all of them are single mothers by choice. Uh, more than half of my children are with lesbian couples. So you have two moms in the picture. So even if I'm not a full-time dad, a lot of these kids are growing up in two-parent households. And then sometimes there is a dad in the picture. So I have some heterosexual couples uh, reaching out. You know, half the time that... Uh, you have people struggling with fertility. It's the it's the mother's fault, but half the time it's the father's fault. So you have a lot of uh, uh, couples that uh, struggle with fertility where the the man can't um, produce. And uh, you know, I, I mean, like, would anyone be against that? Like helping a heterosexual couple where there's already a mom and a dad in the picture. And what about if there's two moms? You know, uh, it, you know, people. Well. Even if I don't play a full-time role as a father, at least any kind of role that I play is always going to be better than whatever this frozen anonymous donation was. Um, and then even the single mothers, you know, if a, if my parents had seven children, you know, how much different is that than a single mother having one, two, or three children? I mean, the ratio is still mm -hmm. there. It's still, you know, three children per parent. Right. I mean, I'm not trying to pathologize what you're doing. I think that you're definitely not public enemy number one, you know, and you're you're spreading love more than not love. But there's definitely um, imperfections, and uh, you're cre you're creating certain situations for people that are devoid of uh, normalcy. Like, would you want your grandchildren to have this sort of thing? Like, would you want Tyler, your mm -hmm. first child? who's going to come on soon. Would you want him to be doing this sort of lifestyle? I mean, yeah. It doesn't matter what I want. <laughs> he doesn't listen to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, was there ever a point of regret? I was able to spread uh, so much uh, love and joy, but um, you know, whatever love and joy I spread, I get it back in abundance. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I Israel, have, um, I, my bank account doesn't show it, you know, cause um, I'm very, very poor, but I feel very, very rich, you know, and, um, I think I'm like the Elon Musk of love and joy. I mean, I really have it in abundance and there's a lot of people that really, really care about me and uh, love me. And, uh, well, Elon's got a lot of kids, but he can afford them. Correct. Like uh, your 117th child or 18th, you have seven mm -hmm. pregnant women now or something like 11. that. 11, like you have no way of being able to support them. Uh, that's correct. But, um, the uh, mothers do most of the heavy lifting or all the heavy, lif heavy lifting in, in most cases. So, you know, th they understand the deal uh, before that, you know, I'm not really in a position to be able to provide for them financially. But th mm -hmm. the kids generally don't uh, struggle. And I think even if they do struggle financially, uh, you know, they're not lacking love in their life and attention. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing. And just because uh, you you're know, probably off on that assessment, right? I'm sure there's at least a few of the ch children that you've had that are lacking in love and affection. And, you know, th these children were n not accidents. They were very, very much wanted. So, um, nope, I don't think I'm off at all. I think these children have a lot of love in their life. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, tomorrow um, I'm going to employ uh, my son Tyler to help me schlep some furniture for one of my children's mothers whose mother died and we have to uh, schlep a dresser. And uh, I was talking to her this past week and she did like, you know, I didn't get the clear number, but I would, wouldn't be surprised if it was like north of 20 in vitro fertilization cycles. Like she was doing it for years and years and years before she met me because we were just talking about the different clinics and it seems like she went to almost every clinic in the Northeast. Like the sacrifices that she made in order to have this child are, I mean, it's astronomical. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating by saying that she took thousands of needles. Like she had to inject herself many thousands of times just to have this baby. I don't think there's anybody more loved in the world than the child that she gave birth to. She was, you know, in her fifties when she gave birth, but it didn't stop her from trying. She's been trying since she was in her thirties, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you look at the sacrifices that she made to have that child. And a lot of the women that, you know, didn't use a clinic, the vast majority of them, I'm just handing it off in a cup. Uh, but these were children that were wanted. In fact, wanted so much, they, 
many times they had to ask a random stranger to help them conceive the child. It's not a comfortable thing, you know, that they would have to, you know, go ask a random stranger and meet and do it in uncomfortable circumstances. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have to get on a plane for the first time to meet me. Right. And sometimes they left the country for the first time to go abroad uh -huh. just so that we can use a fertility clinic that's more affordable. Uh, these children are very much loved. First time I met you, we were at the Bronx Zoo. We were at the gorilla section, and you had just done a donation by the gorillas, and you were zipping up your pants holding one of your children. And I was like, wow, this is the guy right here. <laughs> this is it. He's in character. Uh, that was a success. Uh, that was that a donation. success. Yes, it was. We did conceive. In fact, she's two for two. So we met one time to conceive the big brother, and then we met one time to conceive the younger brother. So mm -hmm. they are ready for number three. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a trans couple. I think it's two women, but one identifies as a man. Mm -hmm. And um, they are very, very loving. I mean, we don't get to see each other that often. They live deep in Connecticut, uh, New Britain. Um, it's a couple hours away. Yeah. But, you know, I, I every day they're posting online <laughs> and sharing pictures of the two boys. And uh, I take a lot of joy, mm -hmm. even if I'm not uh, actively participating in raising this child. Um, Do you want and, them to reach out and have relationships with these children? Uh, uh, th these moms reach out to me all the time. Uh, they reached out to me this week and uh, we want to get together now that the weather's getting warmer. And um, we'll probably do another date at the Bronx Zoo uh, and, and uh, get, get to see both of the boys. Mm -hmm. And I think um, sometimes perhaps what the, – and they're ready for number three already. So maybe you're our good luck charm and you could be there for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you did the first one without me, so I think that you're, you're it's you, you that you do must have some sort of special sperm, or maybe no, maybe it's just. I think she's it was teamwork. She was quite fertile, uh -huh. you know. Okay, right on. Well, let's just do a little bit of legal stuff before we bring Tyler on. So you have Israel banned you from doing more of these. Yeah, I, we could go all sorts of legal questions because. Um, I need an entertainment lawyer because mm -hmm. uh, yesterday I was uh, filming and I, there was a crew of a whole a dozen people and I was the only one in the room not getting paid, you know, and uh, I did Dr. Oz uh, the past few, a few months ago and he didn't pay me a penny. He didn't even reimburse me for parking. I did Drew Barrymore and I didn't get paid for that. And I'm like, I, I need an entertainment How lawyer How was Drew first. Barrymore? Drew Barrymore was wonderful, yeah. you know. Dr. Oz was pushing you a little bit, I felt like. Uh, doesn't you could push me too? It's okay. It's good because you know sometimes when you ask tough questions, it gets me thinking more to understand mm -hmm. and help. Uh, you know, try and do the right thing because you know I am making this up as I go along. It's not some master plan that I'm uh, implementing mm -hmm. and putting into place. Uh, and you know, I want to do the right thing, and it feels like I'm doing the right thing before, during, and after. Uh, but obviously, in hindsight's twenty twenty. I know I'm making mistakes. You know, sometimes I'm only learning about those mistakes after the fact. But I, mean, I think some of the people that you've some of the people that you've had kids with are just like they're not in a good place. And you know, you're so you're bringing well I, children into this world. Like you have one woman recently. Like before we were here, you were dealing with a custody issue because one woman had like a mental breakdown and she's a wall checked herself into a psych ward and then never no one can find her again. I mean. You know, but she didn't check like, herself into the, the psych ward. Like, well, I like, met her. You? Mm -hmm. you know, the, the truth is, it's funny because the first time that woman that you're talking about reached out to me, um, she said, uh, when, she's ovulating. Can I come meet her? Uh, she's living in her friend's car. I said, wait a minute, you're living in your friend's car? Like, it's not even her car. <laughs> it's her friend's car, and that's where she's living. Like, where are you going to raise the baby in the back seat? And she told me, well, I have a family in California, and they're going to help uh, me raise the child, but I'm here in New York trying to get pregnant first with you, and then once this works out, then I'll be with the family. And anyway, I didn't know about her mental issues. In fact, even if I wanted to do some kind of invasive investigation, I would have had to give her a blood test, right, to see if she's on any psychiatric meds, and that wouldn't have showed up anything either, because uh, she's not on her meds, and you're that's not, part of the being, problem. You're not being honest with yourself, because she's living in her friend's car. That's, you don't need oh, a blood I already, test. Oh, I already said that uh, I, I'm not going to help her, and, uh, and then she ended up getting an apartment, you know, and... Um, she rented a room and then I, and then I said, okay, fine. You know? So I wasn't like I went to the back seat and it made the baby. Uh, I, 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 I told her no, she ended up getting a, a room and then I ended up giving a child. I didn't know about her mental health issues. There was no way I could have known. Uh, she seemed very, very sweet. 
and very, very kind. And it's true. Uh, now I'm learning that, uh, you know, listen, it was around two, three weeks ago, I, w- I was flying to India and the day before my flight, I got a call from Child, Pro- Child Protective Services saying, you know, the the baby's in the hospital, the mother checked into the psych ward and, you know, do you want uh, custody of this baby? So I have a lawyer and uh, have a, I'm going to set up a meeting with him uh, this week. The state uh, or the city assigns me a lawyer for free. She has a lawyer. The um, child has a lawyer. There's uh, Child Protective Services. We've had, uh, just in the past three weeks, we've had probably uh, four court cases and we have on the docket a whole bunch more. Um, so I'm um, obviously I'm replaying it and going back and saying that I was misled. You know, obviously there was no family in California that that's going to help her. Uh, she has an ex husband who pays her rent, I believe now, but um, I, I don't know if he's operating with a full deck either. And so she was nothing short of a phenomenal mother for the first eight months of the child's life. The child's nine months old now, and I think she ran into trouble. I, I don't know if she had COVID or some stress brought on this. Uh, she's schizoaffective. So I think she's struggling with some mental health issues, but I'm pretty sure that once she gets back on her meds, that she could go back to being a very dedicated, uh, devoted, loving mom. And uh, what's ironic is that, you know, this kid was about to go into foster care. Uh, And then, you know, I had, I shared this story with some moms and virtually everyone I shared the story with uh, immediately said, I'll take care of the baby, bring the baby here and uh, I'm going to give this baby a great home. And it wasn't one person or two people. I have over 100 baby mamas who are all ready to step up to the plate Mm -hmm. and take care of this baby and make sure this baby doesn't go into foster care because they feel very, very connected to this child. This child has, I mean, it was a terrible situation, but for me, it just warmed my heart Mm -hmm. and brought me so much... just the fact that this baby has so much love in his life and how so many people just wanted to make sure that this baby's going to be okay. Um, and now the kid is currently living with one of my other children's mothers and uh, he's bonding with his uh, half sibling and his half brother and he's lacking nothing and I'll be going to visit this week and um, then if they ever um, get tired of it, that there's just another hundred uh, baby mamas that uh, would be happy to step up to the plate as well. Wow. I, Do you ever use protection? Uh, you know, the vast majority of my children are conceived in a cup. Uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to conceive the old fashioned way because, uh, I got a woman from Tarrytown who's ovulating today and I'm going to have to help her. And then I got another positive test from Poughkeepsie and she wants to meet up and uh, get sperm and there'd really be no way to protect uh, myself or of these other women. And, uh, you know, with, if I was doing it the old fashioned way. So once in a while I have a moment of weakness, but uh, they're very far and few between. So mm-hmm. my last child that was conceived the old fashioned way, you know, was around two years ago. You know, and before that was four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not, and, and I had 31 kids born. Do you get in 20, regularly tested though? And I'm otherwise? getting regularly tested all the time, constantly. And I had 31 kids born uh, in 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, on four, you look great. You know, I don't know how old you are, but you look. It looks like it's keeping you young. All this. Uh, oh, I don't know. You know, I have more white hairs than all of my older brothers. You know, and uh, people say, "Well, that's because you have more children." But uh, I think it's because I have more baby mamas. That's mm-hmm. that's what <laughs> gives you the white hairs. So, what Israel? I know banned you from having kids over there. You can't have kids in Israel. Right? Well, I could still. Uh, you go into the back seat or go into the bushes or go into the bedroom and make a baby. That's well, they won't certainly know feasible. About it, but I'm cool. they, they won't know or care. I'm, I'm still, everyone's allowed. That's so you're a not reproductive allowed to donate right. Sperm. I cannot donate sperm in a clinic. I can't go to a clinic and give sperm. And even if I, even is. if it's, I say, as my partner. Well, every country has different laws. And the U.S. is the Wild West of fertility. Any guy, any girl can have a baby. And the laws in Israel are quite forward thinking as well. Like in France, you have to be married. In Germany, you have to be married. And you know, it, it, the hoops that lesbian couples would have to jump through uh, to have a baby in most countries, that it's just non-existent. Um, in, in the U.S., uh, it, it's very lax. The issue is the cost. It's prohibitive and it's almost impossible to afford it for the average person. Uh, in Israel, any it, it's a very paternalistic country, so everyone gets free IVF or fertility treatments up until the age of 45. So you have a lot of women that are choosing to be single mothers by choice. And sometimes they wait a little too long and they might wait until their 40s because they know that they have these unlimited cycles of IVF. So they give it their very, very last chance. Whereas maybe in the US, you really should 
like start settling down at 37 because unless you want to exhaust all your funds at a fertility clinic, you need to start having the children in your 30s. But in Israel, when you have unlimited fertility treatments, you know, when you're 43 and you do IVF, you only have a 10% chance of having success each cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's quite low. It's a 90% failure rate. And to drop 15 grand on a 10%, that means you're going to probably have to try a couple times. But when you could try a couple times for free, then it's okay to wait till you're a little older. Anyway, I froze sperm for six different women in Israel. And, uh, you know, I think the New York Post wrote an article, but then some Israeli paper picked up that article. Maybe they got some of the facts wrong as well because uh, they never really interviewed me, but then they rewrote the article. Maybe they said I had 20-something kids at the time, but they may have said that I had 20-something kids in Israel at the time or whatever it was. It was the Minister of Health read this article and said, wait, this is not – in the spirit of the law. Now, you could have a gay guy and a lesbian woman have a baby in Israel, no problem. All they require is to comply with the law, have a parenting contract, have the father accept responsibility for the child, and then it's allowed. If that doesn't happen, then you need to use frozen anonymous sperm. But if you want it to be known, then they have to sign a parenting contract. So that's what I did. And I signed parenting contracts with six different women, and then I was flying back to Israel to do it uh, again with the seventh woman. These weren't minors. These are consenting adults, okay? This was a 43-year-old woman. She knew what she was doing. She knew about my other children. She knew who she wanted to have uh, to be the father of her child. And we went to the clinic, and uh, the clinic, uh, I think the Ministry of Health sent out a WhatsApp group to all of the fertility clinics in Israel and said, you know, don't – don't, don't take in. Guy. Don't allow this guy. Exactly. And then the six women that I had frozen sperm for had to destroy it. They uh, had to throw it out, and a lot of them purchased – Anonymous sperm, you know, and of course, there's all sorts of uh, Jewish archaic laws where then they had to buy non-Jewish, so they ended up getting Muslim sperm from Croatia, you know, because somehow that's better than having a father who's not actively involved. It, there's really no in between. Anyway, uh, you know, there's a new minister of health now because they have a new government, so I don't know if they rethought this ban, um, you know, but at the time, uh, the minister of health had a very big beard. He was a very religious Jew, and he just felt like, even though technically I'm complying with the law because I was signing parenting agreements, accepting responsibility for each of these children, he felt that can't be possible if I have so many children, you know, and uh, that's why he banned me. And the mother was so upset, this woman who wanted a child didn't want to use anonymous sperm. She just didn't feel comfortable with it, having the child never know who the father is, and she ended up hiring a lawyer and suing the Ministry of Health, saying, you don't really have a right to choose who I can pick as the father of my child. That really shouldn't be something you get to decide. Uh, And in the end, they had to add me onto the uh, lawsuit, and it went to district court. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. In the end, the rulings didn't go our way, even though I think if she would have pursued it further, it would have. But they did succeed in getting so many delays that by the time she would have gotten permission to use my sperm, she would have needed an egg donor because she would have been too old to even use the sperm. So she ended up giving up and dropping the lawsuit. But, you know, uh, it, it's unfortunate because now she doesn't have children. And I was very, very sad, not for myself, but I was very, very sad for her because she would have been an amazing mother. You know, she was a veterinarian initially and she had to quit her job as a veterinarian because she was just taking in all of these wayward animals and giving them free treatment to everybody who came in that she realized that her career as a veterinarian is not going to go her way because she she was losing money because she was just helping everyone because she had such a big heart. And it's so sad that this woman could have become a mother because of some archaic stupidity that the minister of un- – it was just really – doesn't make any sense. Like they were like, yeah, you could buy frozen anonymous sperm. That she was allowed to do. Um, and somehow that guy's not going to be any kind of a, a I mean, father. They're protecting, they're protecting the future child from you. They're making a statement about you. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's uh, really uh, – you know, if they that was really the case, they could have just met the three children that I already had in Israel. You know, they, there's no protection needed for them. You know, I don't need no order of protection. Uh, what do you mean by that? What do you meaning? Mean? I have three children. They could have met those children and see how wonderful they're doing. You know, like they didn't really do the research. They based it all on some it's article. It's a that categorical, they read. like on it's, its face. They're like, no, this is not okay. Yeah, exactly. You know, the new minister of health in Israel is an openly gay minister, uh, which is. Probably someone who's a little more forward thinking and might be okay with it. But when I send him emails, he doesn't really respond because he's busy with COVID problems and doesn't really have time to respond to my emails. But I would imagine if he revisited the case, he probably would rethink it. But, you know, every country has different laws. And if I can't have children in my ancestral homeland, you know, what's ironic is that I could have children in every other country in the world. And that's totally legal. But the one country I can have children in is my ancestral homeland. Somehow that makes sense. And because it, your ancestors are like, no, 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 no. This guy. <laughs> 
die yeah. is way far gone. We are excommunicating yeah. all activities. I have from 117 this dude. kids, so they're all like, let's ban the guy. Of course, I only have three children in Israel, but the, they don't know how many children this anonymous sperm donor has that they're purchasing from Scandinavia. Nobody knows how many children he has, mm-hmm. and that to me is the real danger. Is like, hey, we don't even know how many kids these other fr- anonymous donors have. At least with me, you know, and they know who they are. You know, you could get to meet them, and you could get to know the father. So I'm not so sure it makes sense. I think IVF is still a, a new phenomenon. It hasn't One been around for, for that sure, long. When these kids hate 18 and they want to have a relationship with their father, with the anonymous donor, none of them are going to show up saying, yeah, I got a hundred other kids. I don't really have time for you. Or, you know, I don't, I just physically can't be there for you because I got a hundred other no, kids. Uh, in, so you're in, like in is, way past. In the, Israel, they only have closed donations. So even at 18, you don't get to know who the father is. Mm-hmm. So if you want to purchase sperm in Israel of a known donor, meaning after 18, you want to maybe be able to have like an open donation, then you have to actually purchase it from abroad. You can't even purchase it in Israel. Uh, you'd have to purchase it from abroad in order to do it. I, I'm not so sure I understand the science. Like why are you making these women go abroad to another country to get the sperm mm-hmm. so that maybe at 18 the child might be able to know who the father is and even then you can't just here's here's his telephone number you have to write to the agency then the agency will have to send an email or a telephone number but I don't know what number you had 18 mm-hmm. years ago. My AOL address is not going to work from 18 years ago. Like the ways that you're going to be communicating in 18 years, like the guy could have changed his email, but it could be no way of communicating and it could go into some spam box. So I don't know if it's really, I mean, I think the one way you can is perhaps possibly try and connect to the siblings. Mm-hmm. That's something mm-hmm. that maybe is a better avenue. You could do DNA tests and then sometimes there's Facebook groups where you write your donor number and somehow connect to brothers and sisters that you may have. A lot of my kids, uh, kids get together on a regular basis anyway because you know they know who their father is and if they're interested in uh, getting together uh, with any of their brothers and sisters i i rent i have an airbnb on march 20th and i'm gonna have a couple of seven-year-olds there and some other moms uh, come we'll mm-hmm. spend a fun weekend together mm-hmm. for my son's birthday who's turning uh eight cool you mentioned you have to be married in france and germany do you have marriage certificates with these women that you've helped or have you helped people in friends in Germany and then have forged marriage certificates in various countries? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, uh, I have helped women in France, but we wouldn't go uh, get married. I wouldn't use a clinic in France. So, well, let's just meet in Eastern Europe. Let's meet in Spain. Let's meet in another country where marriage isn't required. Sometimes it's a problem because the women are uncomfortable going to another country to get fertility treatments. Maybe they don't speak French, you know, and uh, it's uncomfortable for them to you know, it's a procedure, it's surgery, they're going under the anesthesia, and mm-hmm. they don't necessarily want to go to another country to get the fertility treatment. So there were scenarios where I had to get married to the mother uh, in order to um, allow her to be able to conceive in her own country. Mm-hmm. But uh, the vast majority of the women will just travel. And even a lot of the women in the U.S., we end up just traveling to another country to conceive the baby just because most states don't mandate any kind of fertility coverage. If Chances are, if you're living in the U.S., you do not have fertility coverage. So even if you're a school teacher in Kentucky – uh, and you have that city or state insurance, you're not getting any fertility coverage that comes with that. Mm-hmm. So uh, you're going to have to go abroad because the cost in you know Kentucky could be ten or fifteen grand, but you know you could go to Mexico for five grand. So you know you just go abroad. You can't waive child support. So are you getting hit up the wazoo like in courts for child support? Because that's not something that even if you both agree and she writes it down i agree i'm not going to sue you for child support that's not going to hold up in court she can still always go after you for child support she being the mom so right well the thing is is first of all they always do what's in the best interest of the child and it seems like it's the child's right to sue so they can't really have the mother sign away those rights but people are always asking me why don't you just sign a contract and you answer the question is that these contracts aren't really you know honored uh, so I had a few moms that went back on their word mm-hmm. and sued me for child support, mm-hmm. but uh, that's not what's surprising. You know, I have 117 uh, mothers and five of them went back on their word to mm-hmm. sue me for child support, but you know, 112 didn't. So it's pretty remarkable that you have so many women and, you know, obviously they're appreciative and it wasn't the deal, but still, you know, when they... Uh, struggle financially, I'm sure it would be much, much easier uh, than doing some nine to five if they could say, hey, wait a minute, why don't I just, you know, collect a check for the next 21 years? And it's, mm. you don't need to hire a lawyer to do it, but you don't it's have any an open money. Shut, it's an open shut case. And, uh, you know, they get a percentage of my salary. So, uh, 
it's true. The first mother who sued gets the most, and the next one gets 17% of what's left, and the next one will get 17% of what's left. But, you know, it, it, it's something. It's a check. It's thousands of dollars over the course of the 21 years. So it, it could help them financially. But what's remarkable, it speaks so well to the character of the uh, mothers uh, that I've been so lucky uh, to be a part of their families because – the fact that 112 women kept their word, you know, they don't owe me nothing. A lot, some of them know me and we're very, very close, but a lot of them, you know, we met one time, the moms conceived and at any point they could always go back on their word. And uh, the fact that they didn't uh, speaks very well. Mm -hmm. Tyler, you want to join at this point? Why don't we think, uh, you know, you, this mic. you just, you discussed, uh, my family court issues. Uh, of course, I have this custody battle, and uh, we have these uh, child support issues. Uh -huh. We got the my entertainment law issues, but uh, the, the, I, I have some other legal problems. <laughs> I think this. What other legal problems you got? What other strange legal scenarios? Before we ask Tyler what he thought of all of the, I mean, I'm sure you've heard his whole spiel. Oh well, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. This, none of that was new to you, but yeah, let's just first hear a little bit more of your legal quagmires yeah, okay, before let, we let, get. Let's talk to Tyler. I'm going to think of more legal problems I have. You so, know, okay. it's, uh, they someone said more money, more problems, but. I think it's more kids, more problems. <laughs> you know, you're out of your mind. I mean, that's that's for sure. I tell him that enough. He's on out a daily of his mind, basis, huh? yeah. This guy. What's what's the deal? What do you think? Well, after hearing the spiel again, what well, what do you what do you think? About what this? do you mean? I didn't say anything new. I try. Uh, uh, I was very authentic. I really spoke from the heart. I feel like I was sharing exactly my thoughts. You know, and I, you can't have heard all of those stories. I think I think I've heard a good amount, and you know, it, it just speaks to how close we are, honestly, because I, I'm there with him at the podcast, at the interview. You know, I'm I'm hearing all these stories over and over again. Like I, I feel like I know a good bit about my dad, so. You know, we, we, we have a good connection, mm -hmm. nevertheless. Any resentment, any beef <laughs> we should be exploring? I mean, it's, it's definitely there, you know. I, being a kid that's probably spent the most time with him. Because you're his first kid. You know, the more time you spend with someone, you love them. But, like, uh, there are things that he does that can irk me a bit, you know. Um, but uh, it's all love in the end. Yeah, mm -hmm. find me another 18-year-old whose father doesn't irk them in some way, shape, or form. Come on. Right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Do your are your friends? Are you like ever embarrassed? Were you at one point embarrassed because of? Well, I mean, it's funny because in school it's a thing almost to like Google your parents or Google your name, and so as soon as that day came up with me and my friends, you know, you see this article. That's the first thing that comes up with a picture of my dad smiling, <laughs> <laughs> cheek to cheek grin. You know, it's funny and looking uh, like a sleaze ball effort as ever mentioned. Looking like a sleaze ball. I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I take no offense. But um it's it's really like uh, my whole life has been almost dealing with that uh as as a part of my life, you know, and so I accept it and it's it's cool definitely. And I think I'm very generous in the fact that I also like approve of uh him as a person still, like uh, definitely no matter what. And so, uh, yeah, I've just accepted it as a part. So you wouldn't want him to stop? You wouldn't want to be like, yo, hold your horses? I don't, I'm not telling him to keep going. <laughs> but, you know, I see both sides, at least. And, you know, like, even if it takes away more time for me, at this point in my life, you know, I've spent enough time with him that, like, as much as I enjoy it, you know, I'm, like, there are other places where it's needed more. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and you know what you lose in having a full time father, you'll have in having so many brothers and sisters. Uh, I mean, I'm only going to be there, um, you know, for you know two thirds of your life, or you know, it, you're going to have your brothers and sisters for the rest of your life, you know. And when he goes away on trips, you know, I have the car all to myself. I, I, exactly. could, uh, I have the, someone ovulates in uh, Memphis, and it uh, means he, he gets the wheels for the, the best weekend. weekend. Exactly. <laughs> So you're like, keep going, keep keep doing it. And then I got... Uh... I'll never say that, but uh, I might be thinking it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was banned in uh, Israel and I, I, I can't go into the fertility clinics. Uh, the only way around that is if I have uh, someone else walk in with my sperm, you know? So I need to call on a salad and say, listen, can I meet you outside the fertility clinic? I give you the sperm, you walk in and say it's yours. And then that's the way around it. That's happened. Uh, seems, of course, yes, of course. yes. Sometimes it's a married couple, and they'll walk in, so it's fine because the husband's happy to, you know, uh, uh, um, give, you know, get uh, start his family. So it, there's no need. But sometimes I have to 
get a friend, but uh, I'm running out of friends, you know, because uh, obviously I have a lot of friends in the U.S., but in Israel, you know, I only have a handful of uh, people that I would trust. Of course, we want to make sure they don't swap it out for their own, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> mm-hmm. but um, – um, I'm told Tyler to get his passport so that he could do a birthright Israel trip this summer. And if he does that, I'll be sure to join and then he'll be able to step up to the plate and do me that solid, you know? Oh my God. Will you do that for him? Um, Don't do that for him. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I, I will do the birthright trip. That's where we're holding. <laughs> what I, do you mean? Why would you talk him out of it? What's the, it's a victimless crime. I don't think so. Who's I, the victim there? I, again, I don't pathologize what you're doing. I'm on. I'm. Um, I'm in certain. Is it going to scar him to walk in with a bag? You know, I'm not going to. He's just walking in a bag. It's, it's kind of gross. I mean, just there. on its face, it's kind of gross. You know, listen. I changed his shitty diapers. Okay, that's not gross. That's gross too. You know? I owe it's, him. I owe. Him. <laughs> that's where. The, I'm just saying, it's all gross. Doesn't mean it wasn't done with love. You know, it you're gonna be, be able solid. to tell your that this is less gross. Brother or sister, I made you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, but you you mentioned you had some resentment on some level. Like, what do you? I mean, I feel like uh, I'm the oldest, yeah. and so... I, if I could say, I think he's resenting this podcast right now. I think he didn't want to be here <laughs> and answering these questions. It's 70 degrees in New York. It's 70 degrees, you know, he wants to be playing I ball. I drive here <laughs> and whatever else. It's not my preferred uh, activity. I'm so but, you know. sorry to make you hang out with me. <laughs> no. yeah. We had a buffet before. We're going to go hang out after. $8 Chinese buffet. It was, it was pretty great. That was his call. I was, we were going to do something else. You're so conscious of like money and saving money and all that. I mean, like, you don't get any money out of this guy. You get I, some wheels when he's going to impregnate someone else, but there's no way you're having any money. He's got he's got seventy percent, seventeen percent. The little money. I do get, that's why I love him. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> like, if there was any uh, ever any doubt, you know, at mm-hmm. least there's that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, he doesn't make the money; he takes the money, and right. he uh, he has an iPhone 13. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not all bad. Do you want to have kids? Um, I definitely do in the future. You know, I haven't thought so much about it. Do I want to have a hundred kids? No, no, right. not really. I don't want to take up the mantle in any way, shape or form. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what about the fact that he's not doing background checks on these women? Um, you know, it, it's funny because I love him, but I don't love his decisions, really. I don't love the way he thinks. You know, it's a lot of stuff that he does that is really outright crazy. And he's <laughs> such a likable guy that, like, you almost shrug it off. But it's like there there are a lot of decisions in his life that I definitely don't agree with and, you know, are very questionable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you know who else doesn't uh, do a background check? Um, just every fertility clinic in the world. Not one of them does a background check to make sure that she'll be a good mother. Mm-hmm. They check one thing, and that is, can you pay? That's it. That's the only question they ask. And do you have insurance that could cover it, or can you pay for it? And that's it. If you do that, then they're not giving you any mental health questions. They're not doing any blood work that would pertain to psychiatric meds. In the end, they will treat a schizophrenic. Uh, it doesn't matter if there's open um uh, custody cases against you and that as soon as the child gives birth they will confiscate the child that does not matter to them one iota all they care about is the fact that uh, they could get paid and i'm not quite sure why i should uh, put additional hurdles in front of these uh, women mm-hmm. i think uh, lesbian couples already have to jump through enough hoops uh, to start a family that regular heterosexual couples do not have to jump through and ultimately it's an equality issue mm-hmm. And it, it, single mothers also should not have to, uh, you know, it's like, well, why don't they just adopt? And they're like, yeah, that's not easy, cheap, or possible for most of these families either. You know, there aren't, really aren't any good options. The question is, is that, you know, do they have a right to be a mother? And the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is he your favorite? <laughs> well, we know the answer. <laughs> Uh, of course. Uh, so wait a minute. The safe. The good thing is, is that none of my other children are going to be listening to this podcast. <laughs> so we could safely. Don't you say have like a Facebook group you are though, with all one. of them? Huh? Like a Facebook group or something? I'll post it to the Facebook group, and then they'll all be able to watch this thing. <laughs> no. I'm in my college applications. I was the head of that Facebook group. Hmm. That not was actually, like, but you I, were the administration of the social media platform. So you know, there's some perks. There's some you, perks. You, you could join. 
Uh-huh. What are some other crazy? I think you should create a Facebook group, or that's probably not what the kids are using. But I think you should do one of the uh, kids. Maybe start a WhatsApp group of your brothers and sisters, and that you could admin that because quite a few of them have uh, cell phones. Um, I, I got a call from Taraji uh, last week. She got a cell phone. You know, I think do you know who six. he's talking about? Of course, I know Taraji. <laughs> of he, he calls her TJ. You know, <laughs> you mentioned some of the things he's doing are outright crazy. Like what? Anything comes to mind? <laughs> Um, I mean, other than having so many kids, uh, and something specific, some particular pregnancy or place that he had a kid or, I remember it was one time we were on a road trip and then it was just like, it, it's so funny because he has all these phone calls. He's such a busy guy and like, but the people bothering him, it was like a, a woman and she really wanted to have a birth, but it was like a nature birth or, or some, I couldn't even explain it if I, if I tried, but she wanted to have, and you know, like he leaves all these decisions up to the mother. So it's really like up to them and his decision making isn't the best, but these mothers, sometimes their decision making isn't so great either, you know? And, uh, I just remember the nature birth really got me. That was like just something. So it, it was, it went even further than that, but I don't know. Do you remember that at all? No, but yeah, some of the, <laughs> Yeah, some of the mom's decisions are questionable. It's funny because this child that I'm about to um, get custody over, um, when the mother started naming the child, I said, what? You you can't name the child that name. That's just not a, <laughs> it's not appropriate. I, right then and there, she was crazy. Uh, of course, then my concerns were validated. But that was after she was pregnant. Have you, you ever know? tried to convince any of them to have an abortion? I have a woman that's uh, pregnant now. And um, we've been trying for a couple of years, you know, and sometimes you get invested in their in their journey. It's a lonely journey, you know, mm-hmm. especially for single women and struggling. You know, if they're a couple, I think it breaks up a lot of couples mm-hmm. because it's so stressful. The moms are hopped up on so much medication and they're extra moody and they gain weight. And it's just all these tremendous sacrifices that these mothers are making to create the child. So I have this uh, pregnant woman and... Um, as soon as she got pregnant, I said, listen, we've been trying for a long time and you had all those other miscarriages because she was getting pregnant before and miscarrying uh, that I think you should go to a high risk doctor, go straight to a high risk doctor and you know, make sure everything's going to be okay. So mm-hmm. this way you'll be able to carry the term. So she said, no, don't worry about it. Remember when I said that I was miscarrying? Mm-hmm. Really, I didn't miscarry. I, I had an abortion. I had changed my mind. Mm-hmm. I said, you were meeting with me each month when you were fertile to have a baby. Then after you got pregnant, you changed your mind and had an abortion? Like that, I thought was just bonkers, mm-hmm. you know? But now she's pregnant, you know? So yeah, in hindsight, mm-hmm. 2020, if I would have known, she was explaining them as miscarriages. But you know, you could be misled. Mm-hmm. There's just no way of knowing. But Aside from though, aside from resenting me for making you do this podcast as opposed to doing something more fun with him potentially, uh, I don't want to run away from that. Like you saying that someone was doing some questionable birthing process, like maybe holistically or naturally or something that really got to you. Like, did you want to assert yourself in that moment? Um, I feel like I definitely don't want to involve myself uh, uh, as much as I can, you know. But uh, if I have any relationship with, like, my, my younger brothers or younger half-brothers, sisters, you know, like, I don't shy away from that. So that in itself is, like, wonderful. But um, other than that, you know, like, with, with my dad's other activities, I, I try not to involve myself. And so, you know, whatever well, it is. make you carry a sperm into an Israeli clinic if you go to birthright. <laughs> Exactly. That's not actually happening, but you know, like, <laughs> well, it, it, if, even if it was happening, maybe we don't want to share that with the Israeli authorities that would be listening in. So just uh, for the record, uh, it, that is not happening. Right? I'm on top of it already. Exactly. I, we're on the same wavelength. We know. <laughs> <laughs> You're all for um, not yep. that happening. We right? will name it Tyler Jr. You know, just oh in your honor. God. If it's a boy. Pitch. If it's a boy. When there's a reality show about this, you know you're going to be like their second dad because you're so much older than the other kids because you were – like, how does that feel to be like the oldest? It's – I mean, that's – I don't know. It feels lonely almost because all these other kids, you know, I can't really make a connection with them when they're just so young. You know, like I see them, but they're not going to remember anything when they're one, two, three years old. So even these meetings when I meet my younger younger brothers, you know, and sisters – it's really only on my end and you know i appreciate it but 
um, as they grow older, then it'll be a lot nicer to have a relationship with them and like see how that plays out. We got to do a road trip cross country. You know, I have kids in around 20 states. Every time, every time we're on trips, you know, I always have a place to stay. So that's kind of cool. We never need hotels. And uh, of course, in 2021, I had kids on four continents. Mm -hmm. So we, we not just well, in the US. What was that like, though, when you said it's kind of lonely? Like, that's a compelling thing to say that it's kind of lonely. Like, how do you. Who's lonely? Factor that into this equation. You're lonely. Tyler. Uh, I'll never be lonely. First well, of all, well, he's, you're discounting he, what he's. Hey, 18 years old. <laughs> old teenagers they don't even want to hang out with their dad you know he doesn't need more dad time okay <laughs> i think he has more i definitely more. didn't want to come here today um, <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad that you did Thank yeah, you. yeah well funny. i think it's a lot of pressure you know ridiculously God, honest about both him and I, me uh, in this podcast <laughs> if something happens to me i know that the toddler will step up to the plate and uh, you know be the the fill in my big shoes and help raise these other 116 children. I'm happy he has so much trust in me. Yeah. <laughs> that feels great. Are you close with your mom? Um, I am very close with my mom. And then, um, you know, like seeing, seeing that relationship, that gives me a whole different perspective on things, you know, cause, uh, I was like the first one and, whatever they had didn't work out. And, you know, I have two younger sisters that are full sisters and, you know, I love them probably. And I have like a lot more of a connection with them than any of my other siblings because we're in the same household, you know? And mm -hmm. so that's a different relationship that I have to like navigate through. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I have a lot of love for, do you for feel everyone. like you need therapy after all this The guy puts you through? Um, no, no, not at all. Because I feel like, but that's just me. Like my situation is that I'm very nonchalant and not caring really. So, yeah, you, you know, it's chill. not affecting me all too much. But, you know, there are other kids that don't have this time with their father. And then it's like, that could really be affecting them. You know, everybody takes it differently. So, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, sometimes the women choose me because I'm tall. I certainly gave Tyler some of his height. Uh, some of them choose me because I have blue eyes or because I'm good at math. And, you know, it's sometimes interesting to hear the various reasons of why they chose me to be the father of their child. They didn't fall in love with me. You know, these were calculated decisions, you know. Um, and, but, but I don't really care if my kids are good at math. I don't care if they have blue eyes or if they're tall like me. I think the one attribute that I want to pass on to my children is the fact that I'm happy. I'm just a happy person. And uh, I think the Tyler definitely inherited that quality. And I hope all my other children uh, have the same. Mm -hmm. That's kind of nice. Any other legal quagmires that came to mind? Oh, you know, I have a spreadsheet. I could just you could pull yeah, that up. I have 117. Well, why don't you actually pull that up and then... I yeah. asked Tyler a couple more quick questions. It's funny. In high school, I we had to pick a major for junior and senior year. And so the major I picked was law. And dad would always joke around with me. Like, you know, he has all these familial court problems. You know, like, what if I went into familial law or whatever it is, you know, and like was Pro actually bono. able to help out. You know, I'd be <laughs> getting the money for myself, if anything, you know. <laughs> it's probably breaking some ethics, but... uh. <laughs> But who cares at this point, right? Exactly. It's a bit of a I, I earned it. Yeah, I think the, the the loneliness thing that was a really that was really interesting. I was definitely not expecting you to say that. Um, I what did I he don't, say? I can't even lonely? say that He's I feel lonely? that way seriously. But I would say like just the fact that I don't have like I can't share a connection with them yet, and that they're all so much younger than me. Like it feels and isolated. I wouldn't say like without the sad connotation with it because it's not something that's really affecting me so strongly mm -hmm. what about his unique lifestyle does affect you strongly um the just the rift that creates with like my mother and she's very christian and religious and so it doesn't go along with her beliefs and well, so she had three kids she had three total with him she couldn't have been that upset after i mean it's they they definitely aren't getting along a hundred percent all the time and so um just seeing that and how that that's rough. affects my little sisters more than it affects me. Mm -hmm. And so that aspect is rough. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, with, with my dad, you know what you're getting. And he's uh, happy. Like, he, the, the moments that he does cherish and he, that he's there for, you just got to be there and be present for those. Mm -hmm. and so 
Are you going to spit a rhyme for us? He was very proud to say that you're probably going to be rapping for us. Is that gonna <laughs> That's happen? how I talked about the coming. I said, this is a studio. You could, uh, you know, <laughs> drop a couple hits, you know? Hilarious. Yeah, I would like to hear it. Come on. Can you freestyle anything? <laughs> oh, oh. I mean, no. No, drop I'm not going to do that today. But um, it's funny. He He's always, like, nagging me to do stuff. The best parts are, like, the doctor's visits or whatever, where he just goes out of his way to, like, purposely embarrass me. And um, yeah. had lots of funny moments, yeah. <laughs> but now he's 18, so I, I don't have to accompany him on all his doctor's visits. Mm-hmm. Well, did you find anything, anything that stood out of your legal <laughs> you know, they, they, I'm, I'm breaking the law a lot. That's what I've, <laughs> the more I thought about it uh, all the time. How you know, so? for the greater good. You well, know? Of course, but how so? For the greater good. Uh, constantly, constantly. You know, listen, I'm, I'm married in multiple countries. That's obviously very illegal on and, and many, many levels. Obviously, ethically, less so because I'm open and honest about it to everyone and we're just doing it to circumvent these laws. But what do you mean? I'm having other people walking with my sperm saying it's theirs. I mean, a lot of questionable uh, decisions and, uh, you know, notarizing documents constantly. And, you know, but I'm, uh, sometimes there's a lot of hoops that you jump through to try and do the right thing. Mm-hmm. What do you think about him breaking the law in order to continue this? Venture? Doesn't that <laughs> doesn't that speak to like society being like, bro, you've hit the limit? Like you're stress yep. testing, <laughs> testing all this stuff. I think it's it's definitely funny. It's definitely entertaining. It makes for mm-hmm. great stories. And so as long as it's not, uh, yeah. And the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. Oh, okay. uh, we won't elaborate on that. But you know, uh, we he work together caught, in some so aspects. That's not, but- Oh, yeah. what, what did you say? We we work together sometimes. You know, we have our joint we work missions. Together, joint missions. <laughs> yeah. Oh my well, god. Well, we got to stretch every dollar. Yeah. Well, this was a lot of fun. I hope when you do come to Los Angeles, we could do this again. Who did this one in New York? That way, maybe either you'll bring him and he'll you'll enjoy yourself a little bit more because exactly. we'll, be, we'll be in the sun sunny. Let's uh, do, it so do it on the beach. Do it on the beach. We could do that. Well, I took him to LA before. We did mm-hmm. an LA trip. I'm pushing him to renew his passport that expired. So right, we for could that do birthright trip. That the year. birthright. We, we get, you know, I'm you don't traveling. need to scam the birthright. By the way, they're happy to take even half Jewish people, or I don't know. You, were, your mom's Christian. There, they'll. There's so many trips. They're just trying to get people there and to get all hyped up on Zion. Yeah, but uh, I went to India. Uh, last month, I would have tagged him along for that trip, knowing how. Uh, do you, you know, want to go with him on I these trips? Where he I wants definitely want to travel, kid? but you know, we've done so many trips within the states where it's like a lot of, you know, like Tyler, take a picture with this baby, Tyler, you know, like, and then it gets, it, it's almost like a chore. So I'm not so ecstatic to join on a trip where there's other motives. But I mean, I, I definitely do want to travel when I get older. You know, I hear his stories about him traveling to India and wherever else. And so that's very exciting to me, and I, I hope to join him soon, you know? Mm-hmm. Got to get my passport. So. <laughs> you got to <laughs> yeah. get that passport. So you've been taking him on a lot of these road trips. You've been going, I mean, 18 years, probably since you're 12, I would imagine, around then. You started bringing A lot of trips to Florida. A lot of, we used to get, like, RVs, and we did do road trips like that, you know? It's kind of fun. Very, very fun, yeah. And, you know... He's taken me a lot of places mm-hmm. within the states. I've been to like a lot of the states. So, and you hear, I'm sure, a lot of his court proceedings where he's dealing with l- you know, lawyers on the phone. But you can't, you don't, you can't afford a lawyer. You're you're representing yourself in court. I'm, I imagine for family court, generally, yes. If it's child support related, then I always represented myself. But uh, for the this custody battle that I'm going through uh, with the, my son, the the court assigned me a lawyer. What battle? It's not a battle. They're giving you custody of the kid. The mom's out well, of the picture. The, the, the mom, um, well, the hope we hope and pray that the mom will regain custody. That's my ultimate goal. I think it's everyone's ultimate goal is to have the mom reunited. Because you can't raise a kid on your own. It's not you. You, you don't have time. You're not able to do that. <laughs> he's a busy guy, but he's not so busy. I'm like, you know, living with him, he's not so busy. It only takes me like two minutes to make a baby. Okay, it's not like I'm uh, romancing them and wanting them and dining them first. There's no foreplay involved. You know, it's basically just make the but baby. You got a hundred kids, Ari. Yes, you got a hundred plus kids. You don't have time for any more kids. Uh, that's true. Right. That's true. Uh, you know, I, I, listen, I went to visit my son in Memphis I, I yesterday. Mean, I don't mean to say. Stop. Enough. <laughs> Stop. Enough. Come on. Yep. Enough. Get, first of all. Get, uh, stop it. 
what you need to do is um, you need to meet maybe a prospective couple mm -hmm. and you, you could explain to them. Why. I did. I did. I met them in yes, the Bronx. You met them in the very Bronx. Very sweet. Very sweet. Very so, nice people. Stop very nice it. people. Knock very nice it people. Off. Enough. So they, they have to, it's a two parent household mm -hmm. and this two parent household has two children. And you think that was a bad idea. You think what? You think they should have done what? They should have gone to an anonymous sperm bank and got it there and spent thousands of dollars that then they would then not have funds to help raise the children that they have. That visit cost them nothing. They didn't even pay for parking. Okay, <laughs> we scammed the free parking in the Bronx Zoo. They got free entrance to the Bronx Zoo. The restroom was free. And all of that money that they saved, now they'll be able to just spend it on the child and be better parents, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of times women are exhausting all their funds in the fertility clinic, and that's when they come out to me after they're still making uh, finance payments on the fertility trials that didn't work, and they reach out to me to help them. So uh, you met them. They're two, uh, I mean, I'll, you should add them to Facebook and see just how many pictures they post of uh, how proud they are and how much love that these children have. So you thought that was a bad idea? I mean, I can't speak to anything in the past. I'm telling you, knock <laughs> yeah, it off. Exactly. I'm well, telling you, knock it if off. If he man. doesn't do it, then who's going to do it? That's the problem. So it's, it's not, gonna not be his me. problem. It's <laughs> not going to be you. you. It's not but, me or him. It's not me or you, Tyler. But it's, it's a call to action for somebody out there that <laughs> wants to... You know, it's but the, I don't know if you're the best answer to the, to these people's well, yeah. problems. I don't well, think first you're of all, the the, the, we spoke about it. Well, the, these donor conceived children, they don't want to have their donor to have so many children. Mm -hmm. You know, for very valid reasons, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. it speaks to me, and it, it troubles me. Uh, the last thing I want is for them to resent the fact that they then have to share. But uh, nobody knows how many children these anonymous donors are having. Okay, so th th that's that's number one. And uh, it's unfeasible to limit the number of donors uh, that it has because it's already – right now, if they were buying sperm, mm -hmm. it would be – the costs are exorbitant, okay? If you want a quarter of some guy's ejaculate, it's like $1,000, mm -hmm. okay? And it's frozen. It doesn't work that well. Realistically, you might need a couple of tries. So you got to buy a whole bunch. And then mm -hmm. if you want siblings, you have to buy a whole bunch more because mm -hmm. you want the child to have the same father. I don't care what insurance plan you're on, it ain't covering it. So mm -hmm. th they, th th they could exhaust their bank account just uh, purchasing the uh, frozen sperm. Oh, my God. Okay, well, tell me a story that he doesn't know. <laughs> That's a hard one. Let's go. I'm an open book. You know? I know, and so I, let's and I, hear it. And I don't keep secrets. So you want to pick a number between 1 and 117, and then I'll just tell you a story about that child. Oh, my God. 30 oh, do you know where seven. Tristan's coming to visit us uh, next month? He'll be here. It's a uh, brother that he knows who's 12 years old. He just had his birthday, so he's going to come stay with us for a little bit. And um, he looks up you to his big... You live at home with him? It, um, no, no, but he would visit very often to play our Xbox. We had an Xbox that he loved to no, play. No, he, he's right. He's talking about this. Um, my son is coming to uh, New York. Is he going to stay in Tyler's apartment? Probably for a night or two. But oh. um, uh, I don't know. He looks up to his big brother. Um, so uh, that'll be exciting. What does your to spend university think of all this shenanigans that you're doing? Are you tenured? How did they? Did you do all this before you were tenured? <laughs> you know, uh, I was, uh, CNN wanted to film with me, so uh, they were like, "Oh, we want to come to film you teaching your class and go to your office because my office is not much different than this room, but it's." filled wall to wall with pictures of my children. There's not an empty space in the wall to mm -hmm. fit another picture of my child. So they, well, we want to talk and go see your office. We want to go see you uh, teach. So I told them to go uh, talk to my school, see if they're okay with CNN coming to uh, film. <laughs> we'll see what they say. <laughs> I don't know if they really want to be known for their prolific professor. They want to be known for excellence in education. So uh, they, never, they never told you knock it off or, you know, like how did how did you get yeah, well, tenure, I do, I, how yeah, did you get on tenure I, track? Weren't it, it, you doing this before you got no, tenure? No, no way. Yeah, but they weren't unaware. It wasn't public. It's only been less Once than you hit like it, sixty. It, it, it was, it was, no, twenties is I think when the New York Post wrote an article. It was around si less than six years ago that um, so you got that, that it went to before. the cover of the New York Post and it had had my correct. Exactly. So not, not that that would have made a difference. That's my outside. I try not to, I'm not knocking up the students, you know, I mean, I'm very careful to a <laughs> good job. Exactly. <laughs> I do have lines I don't cross. This is a man of principles. Well, I got a guy. lot of mouths to feed and I need that job and I love my job and, uh, I, and, and, and this is my private life and uh, I don't think it's not, not a, that private, but okay. Correct. But it's not yeah, illegal. This guy's laughing at my jokes. You know. That's good. Very public. Uh, you loved being here. You loved it. You loved coming here. <laughs> so this is much. your favorite day <laughs> yeah 
Um, so you want to uh, pick a number between one and one seventeen? I'll share a story about that kid that you definitely it's will a not dehumanizing, know. Dehumanizing, but okay, we'll give it a whirl. Mm-hmm. I'm number one though. Yeah, so you want to, yeah, I can tell you a story about that. Tyler? <laughs> 42. Number 42 what? is Winter. That's her name. Uh-huh. And she's very, very cute. Okay. And she has a sister called I Summer. I was there for that. You were there for when Winter was conceived. That's right. Yes. And... Um, we, we, You're so chill. You're like, I was there for that. <laughs> uh, well, we, I talked a bit to some. I slept up to Connecticut because she lives in Bridgeport. Okay, this couldn't. This was, couldn't be. This can't be the was, worst. It was one. much more painful because <laughs> it was much close. further. I've actually, I think we went to Massachusetts. Not all of them included the buffet, right? Did we go to Massachusetts? <laughs> I think that day, right? And then yeah. Connecticut was just on the way. I or think something. what was the, it was the pool or some. There's a workout room in the building. The I think that's what got me. Or so, oh yeah, she has a workout. It was her apartment. <laughs> I don't know how I talked into that. So you brought him to conceive uh, winter. Yes. Yes. Old fashioned way or she wanted to do way? it the old fashioned way mm-hmm. uh, because, because she puts this cup in, but last time she did it for summer, which is our oldest, she wasn't able to take the cup out. She has very small fingers. Um, so she ended up having graphic and continue. She needed to go to the OBGYN to take out the cup. You know, and it was very uncomfortable because she left it in for many hours. She had to go to the doctor, wait in line, and then it's why do you have a cup in there that you can't or whatever? It was probably uncomfortable. So uh, we wanted to try the second time, and she's mm-hmm. like, "By the way, last time I had to go to the OBGYN, I couldn't even get the soft cup out. It's like a menstrual cup that women use to help conceive. It costs seventy nine cents, and then that's their only expense." Um, You're very into the expense part of it, but continue, yes. Well, it's a numbers game. Each time you try, it doesn't have a lot of success very often, especially depending on their age or timing the ovulation. So if, you, um, if you're spending thousands of dollars each time you try, eventually you're going to run out of money and then you, don't, you can't try anymore. But if you keep the expenses low and you spent 79 cents and it didn't work, well, then you could just try five more times and it's still in the budget, okay? Uh, but when you're spending thousands of dollars each time and it doesn't work the first couple of times, even if you go to IUI with the doctor mm-hmm. and purchase frozen sperm, that's thousands of dollars mm-hmm. okay and it has roughly with medication it has maybe a 15 percent success rate if you're young and healthy and have no other issues that means it's an 85 percent failure rate that means you're really going to need to budget for quite a few tries just to get it to work that's assuming you have no issues and no fibroids and no picos and then these other millions of one things that you might need a hysteroscopy but at the bare minimum you're really looking at quite a bit of money to, to just conceive so it is a numbers mm-hmm. game and it's mm-hmm. about keeping your costs low so that you could keep on trying mm-hmm. so that eventually mm-hmm. you'll work so if you pay nothing then you just keep on trying it if it works the first time or the fifth time. But when you're paying thousands of dollars, it increases your stress level a lot, and that's not helpful for conceiving either. That's Sounds why like the cheap Jew is perfect for the job, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, and you can make that joke because it's your birthright. Continue. She had a boyfriend when we conceived Winter, but mm. the boyfriend just didn't want any children. But she's like a young, single, heterosexual woman in her 20s. Mm-hmm. And so it's very different than most of the uh, women that I've helped because either they're older and they didn't meet Mr. Right, and that's why they wanted to start a, a family the untraditional way, per se, uh, or there were lesbian couples. And, you know, And then sometimes you have heterosexual couples, sometimes you have trans couples. But rarely is it a young, single, heterosexual woman. It happens, but it's just mm-hmm. less common, especially. Mm-hmm one that had a boyfriend and then the boyfriend just didn't want children so she wanted to do it herself we conceived winter in we work um you know that office space and she conceived, she conceived the first time that we met and then summer also was had a like w- a business meeting she gave you gave her a cup and that was it and summer's continue sorry summer was also conceived first try we did the same uh, soft disc and then now she's pregnant again and it took us like two tries so she is very young and she's very fertile and uh, I don't think she's done. She's an anti-vaxxer, and that troubles me greatly because Winter got into a great Montessori school. But, of course, she can't attend it because she's not vaccinated. So now she has to, like, pick up and move to another state so that the child can attend the school. Like, she has to go to Arizona or something, you know, all because mm-hmm. she's just anti-vaccine, not just COVID vaccine. I mean, she's anti-all vaccines. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I love her and care about her, but, uh, you know, those are decisions that stress me out. Not stress mm-hmm. me out, but I just feel bad for the kid. Mm-hmm. Right on. I think that about covers it. I think, well, Tyler, what do you think? You think we have, we think we have more ground to cover? I think, I think you got it. <laughs> I think I want to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to catch some sun before the day ends.
No, you missed out on the sun. There's no sun. Yeah. You're done on that. And we're just going to go to his friend. Beautiful. We know what's awaiting us. Right. Um, I'm 46 and I am ready to retire. You're 46. You're ready yes. to retire from what? From, uh, I want to try and focus on spending more time with the kids that you I already made. You don't have money made. to retire though. Uh, I meant retire from my extracurricular activities. I will never retire from my other job. Correct. I would need to save uh, for my retirement. I meant uh, retiring from my. Are you ever going to be able to retire? You're going to have to work till the day you die. Correct. I don't want to be doing this when I'm 50. You know. So I think that. So it's uh, an age limit on your end that's going to stop it. 100. percent If there was an age, if there was a number uh, that matters, it's going to be my age, not the number of children I have. Because for me, it was never about me growing my family. It's about them growing their families. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm getting there. So um, they, they call me the sperminator, and we were going to have Tyler be either the ejaculator or the inseminator. We're still on the fence. Maybe you could like, comment, or subscribe. Comment, I guess, what, do, what should, his, should be his moniker. You know? None of those. <laughs> None of those. I made that joke while we were on a bike ride, and that's the origin of that name. I made a one-off joke. Inseminator, and he's still ejaculator you for was me. Ejaculator. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I like it. I like it. <laughs> he's been practicing. You don't think it's disgusting what this guy's? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you apologize to me every time you nag on him, and it's like I'll get on there right with you. You know, <laughs> I'll make fun of him too. Come on. Yeah, uh, it's pretty gross, eh? No, it's pretty gross. He's pretty gross. But hey, I love him. Come on. The the families that I'm helping grow are not gross. They're beautiful. You know, and uh, and that's really what you could focus on. You know, it's all gross when you talk about how babies are conceived. You know, like mm -hmm. none of it. Like, I mean, his mom were drunk. You know, like that. That's not a good story. You know, <laughs> like. Um, well, you called him an accident before you looked over. Yeah, and unplanned. You were like, oh. I, I'm an accident too. It was an unplanned pregnancy. Mm -hmm. the, but you know, the, that's not the case for my other children. They Has were very much wanted and very much all? planned. He's done it on TV before, so. No, I'm saying just the notion of like, I mean, this is bigger than any TV program he's ever been on, by the way. So I don't know what you're trying to insinuate. Uh, with of course, of course, said. of course. Yeah, take that back, by the way, what you just <laughs> insinuated. But no, I mean the fact that like, the fact that he's gross, the fact that he's doing all these things, the fact that you're, we're, he's saying that you're on plan, the fact that he's so public with everything, like has that informed your identity at all or anything like that? Or? Um, No, not really. I mean, we're, we're very alike in, in certain regards, you know, and people tell us that, like people would say that I carry myself like my father, you know, and that's just with having spent so much time with him, you know, with a guy like that, you pick up some mannerisms, you pick up the fact that we're both like pretty cheap, you know, where <laughs> I knew all the buffet tips when we were there earlier. And so, you know, I definitely shape my personality is shaped by him bits and pieces, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, and then also parts of it are like me not wanting to be like him, you know, so mm -hmm. me not picking up yep. that mantle. And a lot of his uh, basketball game is also, you know, superior than yours. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. Gonna say, Thank her, you for filling that in. Hereditary. Hereditary. <laughs> the Jewish kid on the block. And then I was like, I don't know. Actually, you're kind of Jewish. I don't know where I'm going with that. Um, Right on. Very cool. Thank you so much for doing this. We'll do this again sometime with Tyler. Good. Don't worry. I'll have new I legal so. issues and problems that they'll uh, have. <laughs> new stories. I mean, you, you're tapped out child support. They're getting all of your, they're garnishing your wages at this point. Yes. Right? You don't get a dime after everything. Is uh, no, it's like half my income. That's not that bad. It's not so bad. Yeah, yeah, well, the vast majority of the time I did represent myself, but I worked it out with the mom and said, listen, let's come up with an amount that's reasonable that you I can mediated. afford. You You said, I, lawyer, shut up. I got to talk to the mom. And then you got through to her? Correct. Because they knew what the what they were doing was wrong. You know? The so, lawyers. Not the lawyers. The mothers agreed not to ever sue me. So I negotiated. And remember, I'm not filing for custody out of any of my children, but that's always a concern. Uh, you know... The, That's your leverage. I think, I think what makes me appealing, honestly, as a donor for a lot of these women, because, you know, they could find someone. They can go on the subway and make a baby. They don't need me to have the baby. They could, they could have children without me. He's uh, a subway alternative. What, <laughs> you know, what makes me appealing is the fact that I have so many other children, and they're not worried about the scariest thing for them would be the most precious thing that they're ever going to cherish in this world. Their life's purpose can get confiscated from them at any point in time. And that's what they get with you any other father. You would never win custody 
of any of your children, no? I mean, I, I no, can't imagine it, a judge would be like, this guy is the guy. No. They, sorry, sorry, sorry. If they have no a, you're with me, right? I'm no. with you. If they have there's a child, no if they have a child with a random man, that man can file for custody and get custody. And they're not worried about that with me because of the fact that I have so many children. Obviously, I'm not going to get custody of my 117 children. And it gives them some level of protection. You're, you're they also see these other 117 other moms and I didn't file for custody for any of those children. It puts their mind at ease. It allows them not to be uh, stressed. And um, we talked about the, you know, the, the costs. If, if you limit donors to just 10 children, it, it makes the frozen anonymous sperm that you're going to purchase extremely expensive because they have to go through a lot of testing and then they have to freeze these samples. The, the costs are already outrageous. To start adding additional costs by limiting the sperm donors, uh, they have limits, but it's around 25 per uh, 800,000 people in mm-hmm. the city, you know, because they limit it based on where you live. Of course, in greater New York, there's over 20 million people, so there's no limit to the amount of children. I'm nowhere close to that limit besides the fact that my kids are in 20 different states. But I think that the fact that I have so many children is a reason maybe why the kids would resent it, but it's appealing to the mothers because for them, it gives them that level of protection because in the end, ultimately, the laws need to catch up with the times and – have it where the uh, a man and a woman can have a child together where the, the the donor can't go back on his word and file for custody and the mother can't go back on her word and file for support. Mm-hmm. That has to happen. That will happen. Mm-hmm. IVF is new and it's still evolving and there's a process that it has to go through to make sure that the laws make sense and work for everybody. But eventually, I think that's where it's leading to. They're getting rid of this anonymous donation. I don't think that's going to be a thing in the future. I mm-hmm. think these archaic laws are just going to be out the window. No one's going to be requiring marriage to have a child. I think there's going to be a modern family that's eventually going to be accepted and you see it in a lot of places and even california they started to make it a little bit more acceptable where you could have a known donor not be responsible for the child uh as a donor it has to be done in a clinic but i don't have to be um i could be as a uh as a donor and then not be responsible and still use a clinic so it's different states have different laws but uh i think that's going to be the trend and that's Mm -hmm. going to be the future and Mm -hmm. i think just need the sooner it happens the better because it'll make it uh, uh, much easier and it'll be an equality issue for so many uh, single women and lesbian couples to have the protection they need and then as well as uh, you know people ask me advice on what they could do you know I have a lot of guys reaching out to me all the time of like oh I want to be a donor I want to have a lot of children you know and oh, I don't have any advice you know because there's really no way to protect yourself and uh, I think that's I think the scariest thing for my son because he sees how much I struggle financially and he just wants no part of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this guy speaks truth huh he does speak truth <laughs> Uh, he, that, that you gotta give him he's very honest honest right. uh, <laughs> honest yeah he's very honest <laughs> honest <laughs> yeah. eh you did like a Larry David like eh <laughs> he's honest I don't know no yes you're done I, I feel like I answered all your questions as honestly as I could yeah you did mm-hmm. he's an open book mm-hmm. right it's interesting. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, you know, I have, I have things that I try not to share. I obviously try and protect the anonymity for some of the mothers, or maybe they have stories they can't share. Like, you know, some mothers are very, very private. So I have some, you know, obviously, you know, I can't, I don't want to share, you know, who, who the women in Israel that I helped, uh, where I had someone else walk in with a sperm. I don't want to share the countries where I was married because that, that mother it, it may get stressed out. So mm-hmm. there's things that I, I keep private, but it's nothing about myself. And these people are just hitting you up on Facebook or something and then you're going to the most random places in the world and meeting them in buses, bus benches or I mean targets or whatever. Listen, obviously, uh, if, it depends on their age and where they live. Mm-hmm. But uh, if they want to use a clinic and they have insurance, then that's always a good option. Mm-hmm. Um, if they don't have insurance, then we explore other options about perhaps going abroad. But the vast majority of the time, we're just meeting. And, of course, this woman from uh, – Albany today that's ovulating wants to meet halfway in Poughkeepsie, you know, so, you know, I could drive halfway to Poughkeepsie, they could drive halfway to Poughkeepsie, that's not halfway, but if we were going to meet, we're not going to get a hotel, we only need to meet for two minutes, so there's no point in getting a hundred dollar hotel, it's the sample, I can hand it off, they put it inside, and then we go on our way, and then the no expense was incurred. Sorry. And you're still, and you're close with your parents, do you know his parents? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say that I share such a close relationship with them, but I I do know them, and I do get to see them from time to time. Mm-hmm. And so that's nice. You know, any interaction I have with like any part of family that I'm you like not accustomed to seeing so often is, is great. So hey, he's close with a lot of his cousins. Mm-hmm. Mm, a lot of my kids are 
They're like sure. yeshivish kids that you're like, hey, what up? I'm the Shabbos goy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said that right? Nice. Yeah. Good. Well right, done. You can do things for them on Shabbat I that they can't. flip the light switch. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. This was really, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. This is better than Poughkeepsie. Oh, yeah, of course. I enjoyed it. As I said at the top and during the interview, I strongly condemn what Ari's doing, and I really hope that he stops. I think that the legislature hasn't put out legislation to protect people against this kind of behavior because he's a lone wolf and it's unprecedented. But I believe that if there was even one more instance of this kind of behavior, there would be legislation protecting people against it. Ari called me for some advice after we had this conversation, and I told him full stop, I think that your children have a claim against you for civil negligence. You owe them a duty of care, and you are violating that duty of care knowingly because only you, more than the moms, know how strapped you are for resources, how you're violating the law in certain instances, how in certain instances you're helping people have kids in really one case where the mom had a mental illness that caused her to have to be in a psych ward and Child Protective Services had to get involved. So I think that they would have a winnable claim against him for civil negligence. I think that Ari made a really compelling point about love, that he's creating more love than not love. And I'm curious to hear what you think. Thanks for tuning in.